Praise God. This is a great place to go to church. Amen. It's a great place to experience the presence of God. Every time we get together, God is here. The word of God says where two or more are gathered together in his name, he is already there in the midst of them. Aren't you glad God's here in the midst of us this morning? Amen. Amen. My name's Bill Canfield. I'm the senior elder here at World Harvest Church. It's my privilege, my privilege to be able to share the word of God with you this morning. Let me just give you a word of explanation. Pastor Parsley intended to be here this morning, but uh, he had a little uh, situation yesterday where he uh, twisted some muscles in his back and required a little bit of uh, uh, medical attention. And he's fine. He's recovering. But, you know, it's just like the devil in the midst of one kind of recovery to try to slip something in, else in on you that you got to recover from. Uh, we're just believing God that he's healed of it all. Amen. Amen. Now, don't be discouraged about anything. Uh, the devil is a liar. God is the healer. And whatever it is that he promised in his word, he will surely perform. And we're just believing God for our pastor. We continue to believe God for his complete recovery. And we're continuing to believe God that whatever it is that you're dealing with, you're experiencing victory over as well. Can anybody say amen? amen. Praise God. So uh, we want to encourage you to continue to pray for Pastor Parsley and his family. And we want to thank you for your continued prayers on his behalf. And uh, we'll see him back here really, really soon. Now, don't forget, we do have service at World Harvest Church on Sunday night. Somebody said, well, this is the weekend after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving holiday is over. We're not going to stop thanking God, but we are going to gather together here tonight at 7 o'clock. Amen? Ah, ha, ha. You never know what it is that God might want to do on your behalf when we get together here this evening. I wouldn't miss it if I were you. Look at somebody next to you and say, I wouldn't miss it if I were you. We want to thank everybody who's joining us at World Harvest Church Elkhart. And also, we want to thank God for everyone who's joining us by means of iHarv.tv. But there is a word in the house for you this morning. I said there's a word for somebody that's expecting it this morning. Somebody's about to receive something you never had in the house this morning. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Do you know that Isaiah was Jesus' favorite prophet? Somebody said, well, how do you know that? Well, he quoted among all the prophets, he quoted from Isaiah during his earthly ministry that we have a record of from Isaiah more than anyone else, his favorite prophet. His favorite book in the writings was the Psalms. His favorite book in the law was Deuteronomy. Jesus had favorites. Look at somebody next to you and say, I'm his favorite. <laughs> ah, but that's all right. The person you just said that to is his favorite too. God has lots of favorites. Amen. Praise God. I want to thank God for the opportunity to stand behind this desk. This is a privilege and I count it as a privilege and I don't take it lightly and I thank God for this opportunity and I want to thank Pastor Parsley for giving me this opportunity I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 3 and I'm going to be reading it from a recent translation a new version that's been developed based on the King James version of the Bible. It's called the modern English version. So it'll read just a little bit differently, very likely than the translation or version of the Bible that you have. But just follow with me here. Isaiah chapter 61 verses one through three. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to preserve those who mourn in Zion, to give to them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, 
the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for illuminating our way, for enlightening us this morning, for showing us the way in which we must walk. And Father, when you say, this is the way, walk ye in it, we will be careful to follow your leading. And we thank you for your leading into all righteousness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, this passage, of course, is familiar to those of you who've been a part of World Harvest Church. You've heard Pastor Parsley talk about it and preach on it. And, of course, it was the text that Jesus had when he appeared in his hometown synagogue of Nazareth in the Gospel of Luke. And the Bible says there was delivered to him the book of the prophet, the, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he found the place where it is written, and this is the place that he found. Well, it wasn't hard for him to find. Isaiah was his favorite prophet. He'd no doubt read that passage hundreds of times before. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he goes on, and he doesn't read the entire text that I read. He stopped at the point to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He didn't go on and say, in the day of vengeance of our God, but he stopped at the acceptable year of the Lord. The Bible said he closed the book, gave it to the minister, sat down and said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And of course, you're familiar with uh, the, the rage that arose uh, there in the synagogue. They said, well, who does he think he is? And they took him. They did what any normal group of people going to church would do. They took the preacher out to the brow of the hill and tried to throw him off the cliff. Somebody said, well, I've never heard of that happening. Well, good. I hope you've never been a part of that happening. <laughs> and I hope you never do. Things have calmed down a little bit between New Testament times and now in some ways. And uh, so Jesus used this as a text and obviously knew what he was talking about when he used it. As a text, we entered the year of Jubilee on September 23rd, 2015. Now, we understand that Jubilee is not necessarily a time on a calendar. It's a, it's a revelation that you get of a person in your life. His name is Jesus. We can be thankful for that. Amen. But this year of Jubilee is a real good time for us to position ourselves to receive everything that Jesus died and rose again to provide for us. Uh, another thing that we're entering into here, oh my goodness, my, my, my. It seems as though the Christmas season starts earlier every year. You start to see them clear out spaces in the retailer's shelves before Halloween now, getting ready for Christmas displays. And of course, then we had the infamous Black Friday, season's beatings. As, as, as people went to malls and shopping centers and department stores and literally beat each other up over a vegetable steamer or a flat screen TV. Come on, people. We can do better than that. Somebody say amen. And I hope that you didn't witness any of that stuff. I sure hope you didn't participate in it. Anyway, we're entering into the Christmas season, all right? Now, one of the things about Christmas that even the world recognizes is we use it as an opportunity to exchange gifts with one another. And here's the thing. If, 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 if you're not this way now, think about when you were a kid. When you were a kid on Christmas morning or Christmas Eve or whenever it is that you exchange gifts, you looked for every gift that had your name on it. Uh, you know you did. And if there was one that didn't have a name on it, you just kind of claimed that by default. Hallelujah. 
Here's what you did not do when you were a kid on Christmas. You didn't just find one gift with your name on it, open it up, and then look at everything else that your parents had sacrificed to provide for you and say, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve it. I just can't open those presents. I'm not worthy. Here's the problem. During this season of Jubilee, when God has provided everything that he's provided as a result of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are God's children all over the world that are opening up one gift called forgiveness of sins and enjoying the benefit of that and looking at everything else that God sacrificed to provide for them and they say, I'm not worthy. God's scratching his head saying, what's wrong with these kids? Even natural children got more sense than that. My brother and sister, when you get to Jubilee and somebody says, here's what it is that belongs to you, don't sit there and play with a box of something you've already opened and say, I don't deserve any of that. Of course we don't deserve it. God gave it to you as a result of his grace. And we can say, thank you, God, by opening up everything that he died to provide for us and enjoying it and appreciating it and just raising one hand every now and then saying, thank you. Go ahead and practice that. Just say, thank you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Listen, there is more to being saved than just experiencing forgiveness of sins. And during this season, this year of Jubilee, we have an opportunity to position ourselves to enjoy and appreciate everything that Jesus provided for us. Everything. And he talks about what that everything is here in Isaiah chapter 61. So let me just take a few minutes. Somebody said, I hope it's only a few minutes. Just bear with me. All right. A few is a relative term. Usually means something different to the person holding the microphone than it does to the people listening. But let me just for a few minutes remind you what it is that God intends to provide for you as a result of Jubilee. Look at somebody next to you and say, it's Jubilee. It's Jubilee. Let me talk to you about the message of Jubilee. Here it is. Jesus announced that he came to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. <laughs> Obviously, we understand that means the poor in spirit. Those that are downtrodden, those that are depressed, those that are estranged from the promises of God. Yes, Jesus came to preach to them. He said in that sermon there recorded in Matthew's gospel, 6, 7, and 8, or 5, 6, and 7, called the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus came to make this announcement to everyone who's poor in spirit. You don't have to be that way anymore. Hallelujah. There is liberty available for you. There is provision already made for you. There is an abundance that's available for you as a result of what it is that I've already done. Somebody ought to get happy that your depressed days are over. You know, so much, uh, I, I used to love playing baseball when I was much younger. And uh, there are certain physical uh, and natural skills that are necessary to play any kind of sports. Just certain things you've got to be able to do, certain kinds of coordination and all that sort of thing. I mean, Michael Jordan found out, one of the, arguably the greatest basketball player ever, that he decided after he retired from basketball he was going to play baseball. Well... His skills as a basketball player didn't necessarily translate to the baseball field. Amen. And uh, so, yes, there are certain physical skills that are necessary 
to play some kind of sport. But uh, the fact is, just because you have physical skills doesn't mean you're going to be successful at whatever sport it is that you choose to play. Because most of what it is that you have to do goes on right in here. When it gets right down to it, regardless of what kind of physical skills a person has or doesn't have, it is a mental game. And here's the thing. How you think determines how you act. The decisions that you make. The kinds of opportunities you take advantage of. And one of the things that Jesus came to change was how you think. You don't need to think about yourself the way you used to. Because here's the thing. The world will take every opportunity to tell you you're messed up. You're no good. You're not going to make it. And one of the reasons that Jesus came and one of the announcements he made there in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4 was to say, you don't have to feel that way about yourself anymore because I have created you to be different and to think differently than you've ever thought about yourself before. Instead of yourself, instead of seeing yourself as a failure going somewhere to happen, you need to see yourself as a success going somewhere to happen. And that involves you changing the way you think. You don't have to be poor in spirit any longer. Now, of course, you don't have to be poor physically and naturally and financially anymore either. Now, for somebody that's been behind all their life, that's awfully good news. I'm not getting very much agreement there, but I said for somebody that's been behind all their life, that's pretty good news. You don't have to be poor anymore. Hallelujah. Somebody said, well, Jesus was poor. As Dr. Murdoch said, who taught you <laughs> the Bible? <laughs> Jesus had people that followed him around supporting his ministry on a regular basis. He was responsible for at least 12 men and their families. What makes you think that Jesus was poor? As a matter of fact, if you read the New Testament, you'll find out that one of the ladies who supported Jesus' ministry all the time on a regular basis was the wife of King Herod's steward. Think about that. I think the guy made more than minimum wage at a job like that. Now, if you make minimum wage, don't get under condemnation, but just believe that God's got something better for you than that. Amen. Amen. You can start flipping burgers, but you don't have to end there. I, I heard about a lady one time. She retired from Burger King. She worked the fry basket for 30 years. Glory to God. That's a lot of French fries. Somebody said, can you imagine how many deaths she's responsible for? That's, I, don't, I don't know about that, but... I guess if that's your goal in life, do it as unto the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you don't have to be poor in your spirit or in finances anymore. One of the messages of Jubilee was restoration of finances, deliverance from debt. Pastor Parsley said it last Wednesday night. He said there are people that are coming out of debt. He said, wealth and riches, Psalm 112, shall be in your house. Not the house that somebody else owns that you're paying the mortgage note on. Wealth and riches shall be in your house. That's a word for somebody in the house. Wealth and riches shall be in your house. Look at somebody next to you and say, my house. Hallelujah. We want to be involved in ownership and loanership. Amen. Not in financial bondage. Praise God. I'm, I'm expecting it in the year of Jubilee. I hope there's somebody else that's expecting it too. Somebody said, yeah, but I got a big note. Yeah, but you got a bigger God. Hallelujah. When God can multiply your seed the way he has multiplied people's seed here in this place, 
there is nothing that you should not be able to believe God for financially. Hallelujah. Now that doesn't mean that you can be stupid, all right? You got to be smart. You got to get the right information. But at the same time, you don't need to be a Wall Street wizard. I'm not even sure there are any such things. You don't have to be one of them to be blessed financially. Somebody say amen. amen. So the message of Jubilee was preach the good news to the poor. Here's another one. To heal the brokenhearted. The Bible says in Psalm 147 verse 3 that he, God, heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. There is no wound that you have received that God is incapable or unwilling to bind up, my brother and sister. It doesn't matter who it is that hurt you. It doesn't matter how long ago they hurt you. It doesn't matter how desperately they hurt you. It doesn't matter how often they hurt you. God has got balm to bind up your wound in the name of Jesus as a result of Jubilee. Hallelujah. And here's the problem, you know, we, we, we talk about physical healing and we ought to because people can't believe God for something that they've never heard about. But there's so much more healing that goes on beyond just what it is that's physical. For every wound that people have on the outside, they may have more than one on the inside. God came to heal you from the inside out, my brother and sister. He came to heal your broken heart. He came to take that thing that causes you to weep at night when you're alone and cause that situation to be turned around. And somebody said, well, they still hate me just as much as they used to hate me. Yeah, but God can change your situation so it doesn't hurt you anymore. Hallelujah. Doesn't have to bother you anymore like it used to. Doesn't have to cause you to be uh, thrown into a spiral of depression like it used to. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. And of course, uh, he heals. And that is also talking about physical healing. We don't want to leave that out. Pastor Parsley said after this ordeal that he's been through, he said, I am more convinced than ever before. That physical healing, healing for your body, is included in the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've ever experienced the healing touch of God in your body, go ahead and give God some glory for it right now. It's absolutely true. And it doesn't matter what it is that the naysayers or the doubters say about it. Healing is a part of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This Christ. Somebody say amen. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. That's part of the message of Jubilee. I got to move on. Here's another thing. He came to proclaim liberty to the captives. Those that are captive to sin, Jesus came to set them free. Those that are captive to habits, Jesus came to set them free. Those that are captive to ungodly thoughts and the opinions of men. Jesus came to set them free. If you've been set free from sin, go ahead and give God some praise. If you've been set free from some habits, go ahead and give God some praise. If you've been set free from what other people think about you and have said about you and the conclusions they've made about you, go ahead and give God some praise in the house. Hallelujah. Now that's one of the most difficult things to get free from is what other people think about you. I like what Dr. Lester Summerall said. He said, I learned a long time ago that my happiness does not depend on what other people think of me. Hallelujah. Because Here's who you need to be concerned about what he thinks of you. What does God think about you? I got good news for you, my brother and sister. God loves you with an everlasting love that will never fail and never fall short. And it doesn't matter what they said about you as long as you know what he said about you. They will say you can't. He will say you can. They will say you're not able. Jesus will say you're more than able. 
They'll say you're too young or you're too old or you're too thin or you're too not. God will say, you're just the one I'm looking for and I may have passed over 10,000 people just to get to you. Hallelujah! Now don't get me wrong, you ought to do the best you can with what you got, all right? But at the same time, God is not displeased with you regardless of what you look like when you get up in the morning. Amen? Quit asking people how they think you look. <laughs> now, once again, you know, take these things into consideration. If you've got a piece of spinach stuck in your teeth or something like that, go ahead and ask. But other people's heads is no place to keep your self-esteem. Because there'll always be somebody to try to cheer you down regardless of how well you think you're doing. And there's lots of reasons for that. I don't have time to get into it. Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives. Of course, we understand that means those that have been captive to sin and those that have been captive to habits and that sort of thing, but also that internal prison that people build for themselves. E.W. Kenyon said this, you said I can't and doubt rose up like a giant and bound you. Pastor Parsley used to have a sign on his office desk that said, it's time for you to kick the tea out of can't and go into the canning business. And instead of saying, I can't, why don't you say, I can? Instead of saying, I won't, why don't you say, I will? Uh, instead of saying, I'm not, why don't you say, I am? Because those are the kinds of things that God is saying about you as a result of Jubilee. Look at somebody next to you and say, it's Jubilee. Jubilee. Here's another thing that Jesus came to uh, proclaim and declare, opening of prison to them that are bound. Now here's the thing. That's what it says in Isaiah chapter 61, the opening of prison to those who are bound. But when Jesus quoted this scripture in Luke chapter four, instead of saying opening of prison to them that are bound, he said, and to recovery of sight to the blind. Somebody said, wait a minute. How do you get from opening of prison to them that are bound to recovery of sight to the blind? Well, you have to understand. Back in New Testament times, Jews in their synagogues used a Greek version uh, of the Old Testament. It was translated into Greek by 70 scholars, and it was known as the Septuagint. And uh, that was what was pretty much universally used in the synagogues. And he, he read it from the Septuagint that instead of saying opening prison, the, the doors of prison to them that are bound, it says recovering of sight to the blind. Well, if somebody is physically blind, in a sense, they are in prison because they don't have the ability to see things that other people see. And of course, it was, they were limited in quite a... Uh, in, to, to quite a degree even more then than they are now. So Jesus said, recovering of sight to the blind. That's what he read in the scroll that was delivered to him. And thank God, God has come. Jesus has come. The Holy Ghost has come to enable those that are blind to recover their sight. Aren't you glad about it? There were things that you didn't, weren't able to see, and thank God you can see them now. There were things that you weren't able to understand, and thank God now it's all become clear to you as a result of God's life on the inside of you. Amen. And, and here's the problem with your crazy Uncle Harry. Somebody said, I don't have a crazy Uncle Harry. You got a crazy somebody in your family. You know you do. And here's the problem with them. It's not that God's written them off. It's not that God doesn't love them. It's not that God doesn't care about them. It's that according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, their minds have been blinded to the truth by the God of this world who is the deceiver, the devil. You remember Paul's testimony when he got saved on the road to Damascus and the light appeared before him and actually caused him to be physically blind 
in addition to the spiritual blindness that he'd experienced all his life. And the Bible said that after a few days of that it being in that condition, the Bible says there were scales that fell off of his eyes and all of a sudden he could not only see naturally, but he could see spiritually in a way that he had never seen before. Spiritual blindness. God came to heal us of spiritual blindness. And the reason that crazy Uncle Harry is so crazy and the reason it's so difficult for you to get through to him is because he can't see the things that you can see. Have you ever seen something and you tried to describe it to somebody else and they just said, I can't see it. And you keep trying to describe it and the more you describe it, the more frustrated they become and they keep saying, I can't, I'm telling you, I can't see it. Yeah, but it's right there. It's right in front of you. I can't see it. Well, there's no use trying to describe something to somebody who can't see what you can see. I remember a young woman one time who wrote a letter here to the church and she said, it was the most amazing thing being at a service at World Harvest Church. She said, all of a sudden, God moved in my life in such a way that I could see things that I'd never seen before. She said, it was like seeing the sun or seeing colors for the first time. People would try to describe it to me, but I just couldn't see it. And all of a sudden, when I saw it, it was such a revelation that it changed my life. God wants to move in your life in such a supernatural way, my brother and sister, that he wants, you to, ena he wants to enable you to see things that you've never seen before. So that when you read through the Bible, you don't just say, well, I got through Jeremiah again. No, you can say, glory to God, I never saw that before. And now I see. Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees, were always saying, you know, accusing him of all kinds of stuff. And Jesus said, you're blind. They said, no, we're not blind. We see. Jesus said, I can't do anything to help you. Because you insist that you see. I'm telling you, you're blind, and that's the reason you can't see. Listen, when God comes into your life and says, here's what I want to do for you to help you, don't say, I don't need your help. We need his help, amen? We need him to move us from where we are to where he wants us to be. We need his divine assistance to get us to the goal that he's always desired for us to experience. We can't do it without him. Look at somebody next to you and say, you can't get there without him. So of course he came to heal us of spiritual blindness. He also came to heal us of natural blindness, of course. Uh, in John chapter 9 when Jesus was contending with the Pharisees about their ability to see. He had just healed a blind man, told him to go wash in the pool of Bethesda, and the man came again seeing. Lots of examples of Jesus healing people who were naturally blind. And he's not just limited to that either. Whatever it is that's wrong with you physically, God wants to heal you. The power of God not only can heal you, but your heavenly Father wants you to be well and not sick or infirm in any way. Now, this is a, this is a particular problem for people who have uh, situations that tend to be chronic. No cure. Just have to kind of put up with it. No, you don't have to put up with it. Thank God, the power of God is available to deal with that situation as well. Now, I did not tell you to quit taking your medication. Because when the power of God moves in your life in such a supernatural way, even your doctor, regardless of whether he's a believer or not, will be able to tell that God's done something in your life. And he'll, just, he'll have to tell you. You don't have to take that anymore. Praise God. Then we can all rejoice together. Amen? Praise God. Recovering of sight to the blind. Hallelujah. And then Jesus said, I've come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, everybody in his audience there in the synagogue at Nazareth understood what Jesus meant when he said the acceptable year of the Lord. He was basically saying, this is the year of Jubilee. And they may have consulted their calendars and said, wait, wait, wait a minute. The year of Jubilee is not for another 20 years yet. 
But Jesus said, you don't have to wait for a time on a calendar. I've arrived. That's the reason that when he went over and sat down, he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. You don't have to wait for another time. You don't have to wait for the sweet by and by. You don't have to wait for anything else to happen. I'm here. This is your year of Jubilee. I want you to know, my brother and sister, you don't have to wait for Christmas. You don't have to wait till the calendar rolls over to 2016. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. Thank God Jesus has shown up. He's arrived. He's in the house. And he's declaring liberty to everybody who will receive it. Look at somebody next to you and say, you need to receive your liberty. The acceptable year of the Lord. The Amplified Bible says this. The year when salvation is available. Salvation, of course, in, including more than just forgiveness of sins. Salvation, deliverance, healing, safety, preservation. And when the free favor of God profusely abounds. The free favor of God. Favor. That's what happens when somebody opens the door for you and closes it in front of somebody else. That's what happens when you get the job and a thousand other applicants don't get the job. That's what happens when the banker looks at you and says, I don't understand it, but it says paid in full here. <laughs> uh, talking about your car note or your mortgage or whatever it is. Hallelujah. Talking about favor. Favor. One moment of favor is worth a lifetime of labor. Is there anybody looking for the favor of God during the year of Jubilee? Hallelujah. Somebody's going to come back with a testimony of what it is that God has done on their behalf as a result of them just believing this word. When the free favors of God profusely abound. Now, I got to move on. Can't talk about that for a lot a long time. I got to move on and talk to you just a little bit about the person of Jubilee. His name, of course, is Jesus. Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. He came out of obscurity. Here's the good news for you, my brother and sister. It doesn't matter. Where you're from doesn't matter nearly as much as where you're going. I... I, I, I just gotta, I just gotta pause there just for a moment because you don't know where I'm from. I'm from a little town called Sio, Ohio. That is not a joke. That's a real place. It's even on some maps. In 1960, the population of Sio, Ohio was 1,002. Now it's about two thirds of that, but it's still on the map. Praise God. I don't care where it is that you're from. God can take you from wherever you're from and get you all the way to where it is that he wants you to go. Here's something that I thought about years ago and it was very encouraging to me. If there's no way that I could believe that I could get from where I was to where I am right now. And here's the thing. If God can get me from where I was to where I am, I am convinced he can get me all the way from where I am to wherever it is that he wants me to go. Don't ever tell God what he cannot do for you. Or don't ever tell God what he cannot do with you. Because I am just convinced that God wants to use you to do great things, to do significant things, to do amazing things because he is an amazing God. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. Where are you from? is not nearly as important as where you're going. He came from obscurity, a little town called Nazareth in the backwater province of Galilee, but it didn't take him long to gain notoriety. Here's why he gained notoriety. He gained notoriety as a result of the words that he spoke. The Bible says over and over, he spoke with authority, like he knew what he was talking about, not as the scribes. He was speaking from a wealth of experience that he had with his heavenly father, not just somebody that was talking in theoretical terms. You know, it doesn't take you long listening to somebody to find out whether or not they really mean what it is that they're saying or not. 
You know that's true. That's the reason that you ought to sit closer to the front whenever you're in a public place like this. Because then you have an opportunity to look whoever it is that's talking in the eye and you can tell whether or not they're really saying what it is they're believing. Thank God here you're going to hear people who believe what they're talking about. They're not just talking about it from a theoretical standpoint. Amen. Now, if, if you get here and the back is the only place you can sit, that's all right. That's better than not being in the house at all. Hallelujah. I should have got an amen from somebody sitting in the back right there. Amen. But here's the thing. He didn't just gain notoriety as a result of the words he spoke, but also as, the, of, as a result of the works that he did. He healed the sick. He gave recovering of sight to the blind. He cast out devils. Hallelujah. He proclaimed the good news as a result of the works that he did and as a result of the words that he spoke. After three and a half years of ministry, he entered Jerusalem. And there was an adoring throng there that began to, to shout hallelujahs and hosannas as he rode into town. I could never understand this when I was a new Christian. Because I thought, how in the world did these people, they were hailing him as their king one day, and just a few days later, they were demanding that he should be crucified. I didn't understand it until I began to understand a little bit of the history of what was going on there in Palestine in the first century. Because in that time, many people had gotten, you know, some idea that they were a Messiah and that they were going to lead people to kick out the Roman government and establish the rule of Israel once again uh, like David had. And they were going to be self-governing once again. And so they would lead away a band of followers and the Romans would always find out about it and they'd always kill the ringleader and the followers would all be scattered. And this happened over and over and over again. Now the time when messianic fervor was the greatest was during the celebrations, the Jewish feasts. And of course, when Jesus came into Jerusalem to these adoring throngs shouting hallelujah was during the Passover season when thousands and thousands of pilgrims would come and swell the population of Jerusalem. And it was a time when the Roman government was especially looking out for trouble because they didn't want a bunch of riots and demonstrations and things. And so the governor would be in town and uh, the army would be on alert. And so here comes Jesus into town and all these people had heard about the miracles that he did and all of them heard about the authority with which he spoke and they said surely this is the man that we've been looking for and they began to throw their clothes on the road in front of him and they began to wave palm branches and they began to say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord they weren't hailing him as their spiritual leader they were looking for an earthly king it was a political demonstration. They said, finally, we've got somebody who's going to overthrow the Romans and set up the kingdom of God on earth, and we're all going to rule and reign with him. They forgot that in John chapter 6, a big crowd was gathered together, and Jesus preached to them and fed them, and they were going to make him a king. But instead of talking about ruling and reigning, he began to talk to them about service and sacrifice. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, a lot of his followers didn't want to listen to him anymore. They didn't want to follow him anymore. As a matter of fact, it got so bad that Jesus turned to his 12 disciples and he said, are you going to leave too? Can you imagine? All of a sudden, you got thousands that are there. And all of a sudden, then after you preach the word to them and tell them the truth it's all whittled down to just your original 12 same things going on all over the world today a preacher stands up and says here's what the kingdom of God is it's not just ruling and reigning it's service and sacrifice and there are a whole lot of people that don't want to hear that message Oh, it always gets quiet when you start talking like this, but 
Listen, there's lots of opportunities for us to rule and reign in the days to come. Right now, there are lots of opportunities for us to serve and to sacrifice. And nobody wants to hear about that. Except we got some folks here. We got a remnant of people here at World Harvest Church to say, that's all right. Before the crown comes the cross. Before the throne comes the towel. Hallelujah. Amen. So he comes into town to this political demonstration and all of a sudden he said, I've got some other work that I got to get done first. And all of a sudden, instead of being accepted, he was rejected and relegated to death. The same ones that were hailing him one day were hating him the next day because their unfounded expectations were so desperately disappointed. They expected a conquering king and they rejected a suffering servant. His kingdom was not of this world. Let me read something to you from Pastor Parsley's book, God's End Time Calendar. I just want to read this to you. This is from the Gospel of John, chapter 18. Again, this is from the modern English version. And here's what, listen to this exchange that Jesus had with the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Again, Pilate entered the praetorium and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking of your own accord or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now, listen, but now, look at somebody next to you and say, but now, but now my kingdom is not from here. Therefore, Pilate said to him, then you are a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. My brother and sister, Jesus answered the earthly governor, the one in authority in the earth then, and he said, now my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world now. But let me tell you something, my brother and sister. There is coming a day. I said there is coming a day. There is coming a day, my brother and sister, when his kingdom will be of this world. And guess who's going to be ruling and reigning together with him? Hallelujah. Somebody is going to be riding those horses with him when he comes back in clouds of glory. Somebody said, are you going to be riding a horse? Yes, sir. I don't know what to do with a horse now. But there are riding lessons in heaven. I am convinced of it. I'm going to have to take the remedial class before I do anything else. I don't know what to do with a horse, but a horse knows what to do with me. We're going to have to get that fixed. He said, my kingdom's not now of this world, but there's coming a day when it will be. My brother and sister, let me talk to you just, just for a moment, and I'm just about done. This is point number three. It's got to be the last point, right? Point number three. There is a jubilee coming that goes beyond anything that our minds can conceive. The prophets talked about it. They said, the lion is going to lie down with a lamb. There's not, not going to be anything that hurts or destroys in all of God's holy mountain. There's a time when the saints are going to be ruling and reigning under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ right here on this earth for a thousand years. After that, there's a little bit of a rebellion. God puts that down with fire and brimstone out of heaven. And then we go on into what is what the theologians call the eternal state. Somebody asked Dr. Lester Summerall one time, they said, what do you suppose we're going to be doing in heaven for eternity? He said, I don't know, but whatever it is, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy it very much. Hallelujah. Boy, was that an understatement. He's got the opportunity to enjoy it already. We're going to be enjoying it one of these days real soon. But let me tell you something, my brother and sister. Here's the thing. A jubilee was announced. It was foreshadowed by Moses. Every 50th year, everybody goes back to their original possession. Everybody gets restored to whatever it is that they had lost. Everybody gets, gets to go back to whatever it is that had been taken from them. 
Jubilee was not only foreshadowed, but it was fulfilled in the purpose, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God he came and said, I am your Jubilee. And everybody that believes in me can enjoy every benefit of Jubilee. Recovering of sight to the blind. The, uh, set at liberty them that are bruised. Opening of doors to the prison. And uh, preaching the gospel to the poor. Recovery of sight. Everything that you need is involved in Jesus coming and announcing Jubilee to you. But thank God. Just as certainly as it was foreshadowed in Moses, just as certainly as it will eventually be fulfilled in the future, in the millennium, there is a jubilee for you and I to enjoy right now. It's not in the past. It's not in our future. It's something that we can experience and appreciate right now. Look at somebody next to you and say, it's jubilee. Everybody stand with me, please. Everybody stand all across this great tabernacle. Jubilee is not just something that we talk about in the ancient past. Jubilee is not something that we're just going to enjoy at some point in the future. Jubilee is everything that Jesus demonstrated in his life that is available to us right now. Look at somebody next to you and say, right now. That means you don't have to be poor right now. That means you don't have to be sick in your body right now. That means you don't have to be worried about what other people think about you right now. That means you don't have to be in prison and in chains in any area of your life right now. That means you can experience the free favor of God profusely abounding in your life right now. That means that whatever it is that the devil told you you couldn't do, you don't have to believe it because Jesus has come to announce Jubilee right now. Somebody go ahead and give God some thanks for it right now. Hallelujah. Jesus came to announce Jubilee. I don't know what it is that you need from God. I don't know what it is that you've been praying about. I don't know what it is that you expect to change in your life. But in just a moment, I want to give you an opportunity to thank God that that thing is not just coming in at some point in the future. It's not just something that they celebrated in the past. But thank God it's something that you're going to experience in your life right now. Elder Brunson said it. While we're praising God here on earth, there are angels in heavenly places rearranging things, moving things out of the way. I believe that your situation is going to be different when you get back home than it was when you left your home this morning. There is an announcement I need to make to you, my brother and sister. It's Jubilee. Ah, hallelujah! There's something that's about to break loose in every household that's attached to World Harvest Church. You might as well go ahead and get happy about it right now. Come on, somebody, lift up your voice. Begin to thank God for that thing. Hallelujah. Take somebody's hand next to you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these, my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that we're not just waiting for something that's going to happen at some far-off date in the future. We're not just celebrating about something that's already happened in the past. We're not waiting for a date on a calendar. But thank God we're about to experience the fullness of what it is that Jesus Christ died and rose again to provide. And Father, whether that's a healing in somebody's physical body, whether it's uh, uh, an encouragement in their spirit, Heavenly Father, whether it's uh, freedom from some kind of shackle or chain that's been upon them, whether it's emotional or physical or financial, God, I don't know what it is that they're believing for. I don't know whether it's freedom from oppression or freedom from financial bondage or freedom from debt or freedom from the opinions of men. But I thank you, Lord God, that Jubilee has already been announced. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can rejoice in it as our 
purchased possession right now as a right now reality. I thank you, Lord God, for my brothers and sisters, and I declare jubilee to them in the name of Jesus. Now somebody lift that hand up and begin to glorify God. Come on, somebody clap your hands and lift your voice. It's a sign, it's an expression to God that you believe what it is that he's telling you. Hallelujah.